Siamo in piedi? Sì. Non vuole stare in piedi. Ma dove per la telecamera? Buonasera a tutte e tutti, eh, la sigla della Green Week eh, si è conclusa e quindi è il segnale che possiamo iniziare. Io vi do il benvenuto a questo eh, evento conclusivo della prima giornata eh, della, della Green Week, edizione 2023. C'è una domanda già? No. Eh, ok, ho visto che faceva che salutava e quindi credevo ci fosse già una domanda. Allora, io sono Antonio Macconi, sono il fondatore di Goodnet Territori in Rete e questa sera eh, innanzitutto vi confermo che eh, l'evento si svolgerà in inglese, quindi fra pochi secondi inizieremo a parlare in lingua inglese, eh, però ci tenevo innanzitutto a darvi il benvenuto a questo incontro, il secondo appuntamento eh, dedicato al tema dell'acqua. Eh, Quest'anno eh, ovviamente il tema dell'acqua non poteva che essere centrale, ieri sera abbiamo avuto una serata di anteprima con Giulio Boccaletti e questa sera abbiamo eh, il primo ospite internazionale della manifestazione, eh, Ian Olof Lundqvist che è seduto qui di fronte. Prima di eh, dare il benvenuto sul palco della Green Week però ci terrei a dare la parola a... Ehm, <coughs> 
Alessandro Bratti, che è segretario generale dell'autorità di bacino distrettuale del fiume Po, che ringrazio. Eh, questa serata è stata costruita assieme all'autorità, non dico tutto il nome perché è lunghissimo. Eh, quindi do il benvenuto a Alessandro Bratti e lui sul palco. So from now on we'll be talking in English. Please uh, give a round of applause to Alessandro Bratti and to the autorità di bacino distrettuale del fiume. Grazie. Okay. That's fine. Uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure for me uh, being here and I really would like to uh, thank you Antonio and all the organization of the Green Week uh, for inviting me to introduce uh, Professor Lundquist. We have a, a very fruitful uh, meeting this morning in the Water Palace, very fruitful and very useful for us. Well, just a few uh, information about uh, uh, the authority, the Basin Authority. It's, uh, in Italy, we have five authorities. It's a kind of unique body from institutional point of view uh, because uh, um, uh, 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 the authority, it's an institutional body between the central government and the regions. Um, mainly, uh, as you probably know, the authority deals with the planning about uh, uh, water quality and quantity following uh, two important directives. One directive is uh, the Water Frame Directive uh, that uh, uh, take care about uh, the quality of the water and the other one is the Flood Directive. So, uh, we uh, uh, following uh, with two important directives. In, in this day, um, we are talking about flooding. You know, we have a, a very worse flood in the uh, south uh, east part uh, of the basin. Uh, uh, we have uh, entire territories underwater. And just a week ago, the debate was on water scarcity. So we say two faces, uh, probably of the same coin. The coin is the climate change. Um, water scarcity is not, uh, we, we consider water scarcity not an emergency, but seems more a trend connected to climate change. So we are really involved uh, as authority for our role in planning and governance in this kind of uh, debate. So some question and some consideration. What must we do to face these problems? Is it just a matter of building infrastructures or we need to change something in our lifestyle? Is it possible to find simple solution to complex problems? Pobazin is likely one uh, uh, of the most important basins in Europe. In this area, we have uh, more or less uh, the half of the Italian economy uh, we run the risk to have conflict among uh, agriculture, drinking water companies, tourism operators, and electric power producers. In the same time, I think we must create the condition for the population to live near rivers in a safety conditions. Talking of water scarcity, we have to underline the, uh, the agriculture demand has increased a lot in the last 15 years. We have a huge demand compared uh, to the amount of water available. How we can manage this? Is also in this case the technology is the solution or we have to change our food system? We are living problems that it was supposed to find uh, only in other continents like uh, desertification or salinization. We just have to think about the saline intrusions that we have in the south part of the basin. Last year, the uh, uh, saline intrusion reached uh, uh, inside the river uh, 50, uh, almost 45 kilometers. That is very, very bad situation for agriculture and also for drinking water. So, I think that the title of the talk of Professor Lundquist uh, is particularly appropriate. I found very interesting and useful to know the view of the professor based on his great experience and knowledge 
on the relationship among uh, water scarcity, food and demography of the global point of view. I found also extremely important to know the point of, uh, of view of scientists as Professor Longquist to increase our knowledge about the international framework. So, as I told before, we have a short meeting as authority with some colleague of mine this morning. I think a really important uh, uh, meeting because we try to, to get uh, 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 our uh, relationship closely also to have uh, probably to share some project in the future. So this is just a few words that uh, I really would, uh, would have liked to say and uh, I leave the floor to the chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. To I prefer to use this microphone. Thank you, Alessandro Bratti, and thank you again to the Autorità di Bacino Distrettuale del, del Fiume Po. Uh, so now it's time to start discussing about our topic tonight. As you know, the, the title that we have chosen is The Perfect Storm. If you, se vuole rimanere qui o se no, si, come preferisci? Okay. Okay, you can see that. Uh, so the, the title we have chosen for tonight is The Perfect Storm, uh, Climate Change, Nutrition, Food, and 8 Billion Consumers. Um, I would like to ask and invite uh, Professor Ian Lundqvist to join us on stage with a big round of applause. Uh, just a few words to introduce our guest of honor tonight. So welcome to the Green Week Festival. Uh, Professor Lundqvist is a globally recognized expert in water, food nutri and nutrition security. Uh, he's been working in a university in Sweden for uh, more than 25 years. Uh, he's now working as a senior scientific advisor at the CWI uh, Stockholm International Water Institute that is based in, in Stockholm and at the same time uh, working with uh, international organizations such as FAO, FAO, uh, based in Rome. Uh, we met last time in uh, Trieste uh, last year for our festival there, the scientific festival, Trieste Next, and I suggested him uh, that it could be a very good idea uh, to start writing a book, and he jumped on the idea, and uh, so he's also an international author, <laughs> because his uh, book will be uh, in bookstores in the next few weeks, so we might be presenting the book next year uh, here at the Green Week. So welcome to the Green Week Festival, and now I'm giving you the, the floor and the remote. Uh, you can follow the presentation here. All right. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very, very much, Antonio. Thank you. We had a very good uh, discussion this morning, Alessandro, at the Po Authority. I, I enjoyed it very much for all the things that you are doing. And nice to see friends from, uh, from Tianpo here. We met in September last year. So um, it, this is a big honor for me to come here. And... Um, you know, it's also, as a Swede, <laughs> I'm also, I must say that it's a bit unusual to, to have a presentation at nine o'clock in the evening. Uh, it wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't be uh, that time in Sweden. But that, uh, I thought also that uh, there will not be many people at nine o'clock. But then, you know, when we, my wife and I, we arrived in um, Parma yesterday evening at 11 o'clock, and then there was a lot of, um, uh, crowds uh, cheating, uh, uh, talking, and shouting, and then we learned it was a uh, football. Yeah. It's, it's unusual. <laughs> and so I thought that we don't have that competition tonight. So that's good. <clears throat> and uh, so let me, I will uh, talk about, how do I start this? Um, Yes, so the, the topic for this presentation is, as Alejandro was um, mentioning here, the, the, <clears throat> the um, very close link between water and food. 
And um, what I've added here also, as mentioned by Alessandro, is that we also, it's not only the, um, that we have water and food as a problem, but we also have a growing demand in terms of the number of consumers. And uh, today we are about 8 billion people in the world, and uh, within, uh, in my lifetime it will be more. <laughs> And it's, it's amazing, but when I was young, uh, when I went to school, the world population was about two and a half billion. So there's been a, a quite a rapid increase in the population. And uh, <clears throat> we, we also have this uh, challenge now that in not only more people and um, demand for more food, but we also have this uh, challenge in relation to the climate or global warming, climate change. So that has a big impact on the water availability, the, the fluctuation in rainfall, and the also, as I will show here, there's also an impact in terms of the return flow of water back to atmosphere. Since with higher temperature, the water will go back uh, more quickly. Uh, so I will. Um, sorry. No, I have to. I'll, I'll. Uh, so yeah. So I have mainly three topics that I will talk about. <clears throat> I don't know if you have that kind of expression in Italy, but in in Sweden and in many other countries, we talk about the new normal of water. A new normal means that there's always been fluctuations in terms of precipitation. We read it in the Bible, for instance, about the seven lean and the seven fat years, which is an illustration of that there have always been circulation. There have been good years, and there have been bad years for the farmers. Now that we have it on extreme uh, fluctuations in terms of precipitation and also in terms of heat waves. And it also means that we have a more uh, a higher frequency of floods and droughts. So, so that is a, quite a new situation. And, and uh, but at the same time, of course, both farmers and industry, all the users of waters, they need the water. So we have, a, through the technological development in terms of very powerful pump sets um, and new uh, different devices to lift water, to divert water, we also have a, a big problem in different parts of the world with the depletion of the resources. We have a lowering of the groundwater table and we have a lowering of the reserves in the, in the big uh, lakes uh, here in Italy as well as it's, it's very um, uh, dramatic now in, in uh, the United States, for instance, in the Colorado River. That's one very dramatic um, uh, example. Now I will also talk a little bit about the drivers. What are the processes in society that have caused the problems? And uh, I will then uh, talk a little bit about uh, global warming, of course, uh, which is the main driver in terms of the acceleration of the hydrological cycle, that we have another precipitation pattern and also return flow of water. I will come back to that. But I think also, as I indicated uh, initially here, we also have a quite a new and very uh, changing situation in terms of demography. So I think that, and we have the demographic trends, they are most noticeable in areas where we have the biggest water problems. So in areas where we have plenty of water, like in Sweden, we have very little <laughs> population increase, you know, it's, it's very small. But in areas where we have water scarcity already, we have a very dramatic increase in the number of people who are demanding and who need water, of course. So I think those are the key drivers and, and also as now being discussed in the IPCC report in the um, uh, panel of climate change, the demographic situation is starting to be put on the agenda. It's a sensitive issue, the population issue is a sensitive issue, but I think that if you look upon the, the water problem, the climate change problem, it makes sense to look upon the drivers because we, the people, are um, um, part of the, the, the dynamics. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what to do in terms of policy. 
Sorry? to turn this. This is why, like this. This one? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So then I'll talk a little bit of what to do in terms of policy and also we have a, you probably have heard that, that some people say it's only about the political will, that the political decision makers that they should decide and then things would be solved. I say that what about the social will? Because if, if the consumers, if the people in society, if they do not comply, if they don't like what the politicians are telling them, nothing will happen. So there's, I think there's an interplay between the political situation, the, the policies, and the social, socio-economic, uh, cultural drivers. And then the, these, the whole complex, water, food, um, climate change, it's a very complex system, and all these things are interrelated. So how do you, how can you change a situation? You have the poor situation here. I mean, it's a huge system, a huge basin. And uh, quite a number, of course, of different interests in different parts of the basin. And what's done in one part of the basin has an impact or a relationship to, to what's happening in other parts. So th this, is not, this is a very complex uh, situation we are dealing with. Now, uh, uh, four photographs from different, four different continents uh, to show that um, we are facing a, um, a quite a um, mix of different types of, of uh, problems. The first uh, photograph on the top to the left is from Sweden. And, and I think this picture is actually from the 1950s or 60s. So it's not a recent picture, but it shows that we also in Sweden, which is a, a um, rather uh, average country in many ways, we also have extreme situation. In 2018, that is five years ago from now, in, uh, in the southern part of Sweden especially, we had three weeks of tropical uh, temperature. So during 24 hours, the temperature never went below 20 degrees. And during those three uh, weeks, there was not a drop of rainfall. So we had high temperature and no uh, water input. Uh, that means that we had a, quite a serious drought situation in Sweden, which is a water-rich country. <clears throat> the, 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 the photo to the right on top is a model illustration of what might happen in, uh, in the lower part of Manhattan in New York as a result of, of global warming. So you can see the, the light blue uh, uh, part of the, um, around the lower Manhattan are areas that are likely to be inundated as a result of sea level increase and also storm surges. So about 20, uh, 20 I think over 20% of the lower Manhattan area is likely to be inundated as a result of climate warming, of global, um, of an increase of the sea level. <clears throat> The, the uh, photo to the uh, bottom, to the left, is from a, an irrigation canal in South India, where I was been working for some time. And you can see, this is, I, I think, a good illustration, because at this time of the year, there should be water in the canal going out to the different uh, paddy fields, uh, rice fields in, in this part of southern India. <coughs> but as you see, there was no water. But it's also interesting to see that you can see the, the smoke from the chimney. In the, in the middle of the photo, there's a, there's, a, there's a factory building with some chimney, uh, with a smoke coming out of the chimney. And you can see the permanent vegetation, the trees are green. So the drought can affect part of society, whereas other parts of society are not affected. So the, with the deep roots uh, of the trees, they can suck the water from the deeper layers of the, of the soil moisture, or the groundwater even. And the industry, the industry, they can recirculate, they can reuse the water. You cannot do that in agriculture. So that, that is, a, I think, an illustration of a um, serious threat to the farmers, because they didn't get the water. And it doesn't matter if you have irrigation, if there's no water in the reservoir. So, and if there's no rainfall, there will be not be water in the, fl in the, in the rivers going into the, the reservoirs, and there will be no water in the, in, the in the canals either. 
So everything is connected to the rainfall, the, the uh, temperature and such things. Now the, the, the fourth uh, photograph in the bottom to the right is from South Africa. It's one of my colleagues who took a picture from a uh, <coughs> disposal of sewage from, a, from a, um, I'm not quite sure if it's a municipal um, uh, sewage or if it's from some industrial sites, I don't know. But this is, I think you mentioned also that we have a problem also with water quality. And if there's less of water in the canal, if there's less of water in the, in the system, and if there's a constant amount of pollutants coming into the water, it means that the concentration is going up. So we have a combination of quantity and quality problems, and, and, um, which is yeah, serious. <coughs> now, a, um, so I'll take some water, yes, please. <coughs> Aqua, aqua. That's good. Uh, yeah. So let me give you an uh, overview of the um, the global water situation. There, there is a huge situation. We usually also say that water is a local issue. Climate change is a global issue because the, the due to uh, winds and all those kind of things, it's an atmospheric circulation, but. If there's not enough of local rainfall, then you also have a water problem. So it's to a large extent a local problem. And you can see here that the, the red areas are those areas of the world where you have a high water stress or water scarcity. That means a low water availability in relation to the demographic situation. <laughs> Now, if you take the, you know, the, we usually call the, the mother, we, we talk about mother earth the planet, the blue planet. But the blue, what we see, what the astronauts are seeing from the spaceships is mainly um, uh, salt water, of course. So if you take the total amount of water on, on Earth, salt water makes up about 97% uh, or something like that, 97, 98%. And that cannot be used for agriculture, not for most parts of agriculture. Can, there are some, some crops where you can grow in salty or brackish water, but most not. So the, 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 the amount of fresh water, which you can use for drinking, for, for industry, for um, agriculture, so on, is a two or three percent. But most of that water is in either groundwater, below, deep below the uh, surface, I will show you a slide of that, or it is in remote areas, or it is not accessible for, for general people. So the, the water we are most dependent on is a very small fraction of the total amount of water. Now, <clears throat> we, when we talk about water scarcity, one of the definitions is that we, we define it as the number of people per flow unit, or per how much of water is coming uh, from rainfall into the river system, into lakes and such things. And you can see here to the right that the, the, the relationship between people and water has been worsening quite significant, as I mentioned also at the beginning. <laughs> and here's some, some figures <clears throat> that the, the global uh, situation is, uh, has been reduced from 14,000 cubic meters per person per year to about uh, 6,000. But those figures doesn't say much because it's a very, it's a very big average. Um, you can see that for Canada, Canada has had a quite a rapid population increase actually in, in, in the Western world. So you can see it, it's, it has a huge amount of water, but it's going down, but still they are on the safe side. Sweden has, is uh, rich in water usually, but as I mentioned in 2018, we were very poor in water. Italy is a bit uh, low below that, but still compared to many other parts. If you compare it with the uh, Middle East and uh, island states like Malta, Cyprus, uh, the Canary Islands, they have a big uh, water problem. Now, this is, this is a one very general picture. Now, if you, uh, this is the amount of water which comes through rainfall. Then, especially with global warming, we have to look upon where does the water go? And this is an illustration of three different uh, geographical areas. Uh, the, uh, it's um, uh, 
southern, uh, sorry, southern, uh, southern Scandinavia to the left, <coughs> and then in the middle it is um, Italy or southern Europe, yes, and then to the right. Uh, can I move this a little bit? Ah, oh, sorry, then you, <laughs> you have one more. Uh, sorry, um, and then to the right we have um, an example from southern Africa. And you can, we have assumed in this, we did this together with some colleagues in uh, Namibia and, and Southern Africa. So we, we try to illustrate what is the different types of water situation we have in, in uh, Scandinavia as compared to Mediterranean countries and then compared to Southern Africa. So we, we thought that assume that you have the same amount of rainfall. But then we looked upon the, the ever, 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 evaporative demand that is the, the, depending on the temperature. So the temperature is much higher, of course, in the tropical region. So you can see here what happens if, if we assume that there is the same amount of rainfall every year, which is not the case, but just for, as an example. Then in, in, uh, we assumed it would be 1,000 uh, millimeter per year. Then the, the water in the reservoirs, in the rivers, whatever, would be the same, would be stable in southern uh, Europe. Sorry, uh, yes, uh, it would be say, uh, stable in southern Europe, but in the, in the Scandinavian, in Sweden, we would have increased the amount of water. So there would be a, a filling up of the groundwater reserves and, and such things. And we would have to, shall we say, tap the water into the Baltic or into other water reservoirs. But for southern Africa, and that's the biggest part of the world, the, the, with the um, uh, tropical climate, you, you, you will lose water gradually. So this is an illustration also of the global warming. If you have an increase in temperature, and if the rainfall would be the same, which is probably not in most cases, you would be losing water, so to speak. Now, another example, this is a quite a um, uh, different situation. This is the uh, <coughs> um, um, map showing um, uh, the upper part of Egypt, and then you have to the left, upper left, you have Libya, and then it's Chad, and then the Sudan in the, uh, to the southeast. Uh, and underneath the Sahara, this is all Sahara on top, so to speak, uh, Underneath the Sahara, we have a huge aquifer, groundwater reserves. And this large part of this is fossil water. It was water that was coming to the area through a previous geological period. Now, if you look upon the, the amount of water that is available down to 4,500 meters below the surface, the amount, the volume of water in that groundwater reservoir is estimated, we don't know exactly, but it's estimated between 250 to 130, so plus 130,000 cubic kilometers. And you, these figures might not say you very much, but I, I think Lago de Garda has about 50 cubic kilometers. And the, the, the amount of water in below the Sahara is, and this is only in the eastern part of Sahara, then you have also in the western part of Sahara. So underneath the Sahara, you have huge amount of water. And, uh, and on top of this, you have about, in that part of Africa, you have about 150, 160 million people today, rapidly uh, increase, and they don't have any other water source. And they have in, in Libya, they have the energy to pump the water, and, uh, but there's also fighting between, you know, now you can see what's happening in the, in the Sudan, for instance. So most of these areas where you have water scarcities, you also have a tendency of different conflicts. And you, have the, you, have, you depend on energy to pump water, for instance. And when you start to pump water, you get land subsidization. So th this is not an easy, you cannot just say you can go on, we, we pump fossil uh, f uh, fuel, we pump oil, so why can't we pump water? Well, it's not so easy. Now, coming back to the, the, uh, the main topic of uh, what I was supposed to talk about, namely the, the relationship between uh, water and food. As Alessandro was mentioning, uh, most of the water that we use in society goes to irrigation for food production. 
So if we, one, what I'm talking about here is the amount of water that is available in rivers, in lakes, and that you can pump easily from groundwater. So we in, uh, this is an average figure, it's not the same in Sweden, but in Italy, we're here, here from the Po Valley, that about 70% or more than 70% of the water is going to, to uh, crop production, to animal feed and such things. And that means that they, and that is also what we call a consumptive use of water. So for the farmers who use the water, most of the water will go this way. It will go back to atmosphere. Whereas if you have the industry, if you have a household, if you service sector, you can recirculate, you can reuse the water, time after time, if you have the proper treatment and such things. So there's a big difference, both in terms of quantity of water that is required between the different sectors of society and the possibility to make more efficient use of the water. And, and the, the, uh, the, um, the agriculture sector, I think, stands out as one of the big, big challenges in the future because of the huge water amount required and also as a result of that you cannot recirculate the water. Now then, we had a discussion this morning also at the Port Authority, um, how much water is required to produce different items. We use water to produce uh, maize or rice, or, but also to, to grow fodder to, for, the, uh, for the cattle, for feed. And, and also, so I've taken a few examples here of how, many, how much water is used to produce one kilo of almonds, red meat, pork, chicken, alfalfa, which is used for, for fodder. And I don't know if you've seen this figure, but we had a discussion this morning about the, uh, that uh, these figures can't be true. Now, these figures are based on the assumption that if you use uh, the water to produce alfalfa, for instance, to, to feed for animals, uh, you, to produce one kilo of alfalfa, you can see here, it requires about 1.7 tons of water. So if you, if you calculate the feed requirement and you don't get milk, you don't get meat during the first year of a cow, of a calf, so the, the, this is, a, this is in the amount of water which is accumulated uh, over the lifetime of a cattle or of an uh, animal. And uh, so you can see that uh, the, uh, uh, the red meat is usually taken as an example, about 15 tons of water per one kilo. That means if you go, to, uh, go and buy a hamburger, which is maybe about 100 grams, it would be more than one ton of water, which is required to produce the feed that has gone into feeding the, 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 the animals. Now that is very different from, from the, uh, the amount of water which is required in industrial production. And I think that uh, I usually make a distinction between the biological landscape system and the mechanical industrial system. Because in the industrial, in the urban system, you can, as I mentioned here, you can reuse. If you treat the water, you can reuse it over and over again. You can't do that in agriculture. So that's again why we have a, I think, a big, big challenge in the future with the um, uh, food production and water, uh, water scale. And you need the water during a season. I mean, you, you have to use the water from uh, when the season starts until uh, when the, the crop is mature. If you don't get water in that period, you will have a crop failure or a reduction of the harvest. So there, 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 are, different, um, there are differences between the, the uh, agricultural uh, production and the industrial production in terms of water requirements. Now, I think that if you, the, the, the lowest part I have uh, in the lowest uh, segment of this slide, I show, for instance, the, um, the amount of water required to produce a t-shirt, and that presumes it's pr produced out of cotton. And to produce cotton is also an agricultural commodity which requires a lot of water. 
And, and if you compare all these figures with the physiological requirement of humans, what we need to drink and what we need for cooking and such things, you can see it's a huge difference. So people, so water for our daily bread is the big thing. Water for drinking is vital, of course. If we don't get water, we will not survive. But if we want to have a good life with food and with different things, it's the, the water for the food that is the big issue. It depends. The, the figures that I showed here um, are mainly, I would say, from Western countries, from US, from Europe. And uh, because in, in our part of the world, we have a high, high productivity. Here in, in the Po Valley, for instance, the farmers are, are having uh, good equipment. They, they know how to manage both water and other inputs. Now, if you go to the poor parts of the world, we don't have that kind of system. And that means that the productivity is much lower. So if you look upon a farmer in Africa or in Asia, in large part in Latin America, the productivity is much, much lower. So while a farmer in, I don't know, in Italy, but in Sweden, a wheat farmer could produce at least 10 tons per hectare, or something like that. Probably the same here in Italy, I would guess. If you go to Africa, they produce maybe one ton per hectare, but they have the same amount of water used because they, they have a high evaporative demand. So that means that the amount of water that is required to produce food in, in the hot climate in the poor regions is much higher. And that means that the, the diet, the amount of food that people have in Africa costs a lot of water. So we in, in Italy, in Sweden, in Europe, in the in United States, we can produce what we say a lot of crop per drop. We get high yields, we don't use that much water compared to what they do. So if you go into, into the, the savanna region in Africa, so they have very little, little um, very low crop, very little um, production, but they have a lot of water use in terms of uh, evaporation and, and transpiration. Now you can see also from this graph, these are from three different countries, from Burkina Faso, from Ethiopia and Tanzania. It is a student in uh, uh, Uppsala um, Agriculture University who has been doing this study. And um, she then also looked at how, what is the difference in water requirement for people who are in the poorer segments of society as compared to the middle class and the rich. And you can see here, for, for the, some of the rich people, especially in Tanzania, according to this figure, there are some examples of where the daily diet, the, the daily amount of food that they are having on their plates could get, get up to 45 cubic meters per person. It's, it's an amazing. And they don't have that water. So that's why, that's why we have a very, very tricky set. So there is a lot of both, um, should we say, low productivity, big socioeconomic differences, and, um, and how do we solve this? This is a huge, huge issue. And at the same time, they have a, a rapid population increase. Now, I, we, when we talk about, um, am I talking too much? No, it's fine. It's fine, okay. Because I usually speak too much when I get started, you know. That's one of the problems. Uh, but anyway, I, um, um, I will hurry on maybe. When we talk about uh, global warming, we usually, it's, it's to a large extent related also to energy use. We talk here about uh, water, but we, when we talk about food production and food systems, we also have to look upon the energy use, because you need water, you need energy to pump water, to divert water, to clean water. Uh, and, and you need water, you need energy to transport the food, all those kind of things. Now, for when we look upon the supply chain, when we look upon the, uh, the energy and water which is required to produce the food, it's primarily water which is the big issue because of this evaporation and, and transpiration. 
whereas the amount of energy that is used in production is not that high. This, these figures are both from the, the developed parts of the world as well as from the underdeveloped parts of the world. Now, if you go to the industry, to the food processing, it's, uh, then the, you see the energy sector has come up. We use very little water in the, in the um, uh, food uh, industry because they can recirculate it. You know? But if you look then at the finest day among the consumers, you have a large amount of energy use because we cook, we refrigerate, and we do different things which require energy. So the, the water energy nexus is quite different if you look from the production or as compared to the, the, uh, the consumer, the end use of the food. And when we look upon the, the climate change policies, we have to look upon both the water as well as the energy. I, I, this is from a study that I did together with a colleague in China. Uh, we said that um, China is a big rice producer, of course, and um, uh, rice production in China, as well as here in Italy and in all parts of the world, requires a lot of water. And uh, we said that we would like to investigate how much water is used for the food that is wasted, that is thrown away. And then we looked upon all the studies that had been done in China on the food waste. How much of the food that is produced but it's not eaten but it's thrown away. And then the, the, we arrived at the figure at about 19% of the vegetable food, uh, not the, the meat, not the dairy products, uh, we, because we didn't have any studies on those kind of issues, those kind of food items. But about 19% of the food is not eaten. And then we said that how much water has been used to produce that food which is thrown away. And then we calculated that roughly 43 cubic kilometers of water has been used to produce food in, in vain, so to speak. Now 43 cubic kilometers of water is actually roughly the same amount of water that's now being transferred from Jiangxi River up the North China Plain. So it's a huge amount. And uh, you can see also it covers about 26 million hectares of land. So what we, we talked about this morning, what I say is uh, when you look upon the efficiency, when you look upon the, the worthwhile use of water, it's important to look upon the production, the farmers, what they need to do and what they can do. And there's a waste is of water in that part of the system also. But we also have to look upon what's happening in the food supply both in terms of energy, as, as in this case, also in terms of water. Now this... Uh, uh, okay. Uh, I think, in, as I mentioned also initially here, we have a quite a, um, a challenging situation in um, California today. You know, in California they talk about a mega drought. They've had a drought situation for 20 years. 20 years, huh? and the, the economy in, in California is a very important part of the economy in the U.S., both in terms of industrial, in terms, you know, they have, as I mentioned here, um, they have IT, I, uh, AI, Hollywood, they have uh, all types of, of industries, of course. And, um, but they also have a huge sector of agribusiness big, big farms, which are very effective. They're very efficient in how they use the water. They have different types of technical devices. So they, they are very careful in not, uh, shall we say, wasting the water. But still, they, they, by, by the sheer size, they use huge amount of water. And now they have, uh, with this um, drought period for 20 years, they've seen that the water levels in Lake Mead, which is outside uh, Las Vegas, and in Lake Powell, which is further upstream in Colorado, the water level has been dropping about, I think, between 20 to, to 30 percent. So now they are, they are forced to have some kind of restriction, some kind of changes in how water shall be used in the, um, um, both in California as well as in Arizona, in Nevada and those places. 
And then you can see at the bottom, I have mentioned a couple of figures here to show that they have a very, although it's very efficient, it's also water intensive agriculture. So according to the calculations that have been made, a one single almond, one dry almond, has required about three to four liters of water to produce. And, uh, and they grow about 1.7 million uh, acres of uh, uh, almonds. And then alpha alpha, which they use for, for um, uh, fodder for, for cattle, is also very water intensive. As I mentioned before, about um, 1.7 tons per kilo, something like that. It's about 1 million acres. And uh, th that, that the grazing is mainly then uh, irrigated. In Sweden, we, we let the uh, animals graze uh, in, on rain-fed areas, but here they have the, to use irrigation. So roughly 80% of the water use in, in um, California is imported water from Colorado, but the agriculture sector is only contributing about 2% of the GDP of the California. So now there's an ongoing discussion about, because they have to cut down the quotas for water allocation to different sectors. So now they're talking about which sector, which, um, which part of the system should be getting less water. You can imagine it's not easy. They have tried with legal systems, it's very complicated. And now I was reading uh, recently that uh, in, in uh, Arizona and the desert areas, Saudi people are, are buying up large pieces of land and with the water rights underneath the land. And they also use that land to cultivate alpha alpha. And they are, they are uh, producing alpha alpha in Arizona and they're shipping it back to Saudi Arabia where they're, <laughs> they're using it for, for feeding the cattle. So the world is a bit upside down. So then what to do and, and who will do what? Before I go into that, I, I will, I'd like to take it, uh, two slides here. One which is, I think is a very nice um, illustration of the, um, should say, the policy or the political dilemma. It was a, a saying by uh, Jean-Claude Juncker when he was the, um, uh, chairperson of the EU, he said that uh, we know exactly what needs to be done, but we don't know how to be re-elected once we have done what needs to be done. I think that that is a that's I think that's a good illustration of the uh, because uh, if you don't have the uh, acceptance, social acceptance, then it's very difficult. Then another slide here to show that this is outside the Swedish parliament uh, last uh, August. And um, it's, uh, you see on the left uh, photo, there's Malala. Malala. And then um, um, uh, Greta Thunberg is not on this uh, photo, but she is behind this. It's the uh, uh, March for Friday, or uh, for future. Friday for the future, yes. Yeah. And I think what, what's interesting here is that they, they are talking about uh, that this is a system, systems problem. It's not, you cannot solve the water problem, you cannot solve the climate change problem by simple engineering or uh, technical issues, but it's, it's a kind of systems aspect. And this is what I showed here a little bit before between so say, water and energy, you have to look on them in, in tandem. And so they talk about that we need to look upon uh, change in, in a broader sense than uh, we talk about uh, that we have a tendency to, to plan in silos, single uh, sectors. I think. So there's a need for kind of systematic. So finally then some comments here. I think uh, what's now being discussed in, um, uh, in different um, groups is that we have been, we have been uh, thinking about solving the problem by building another dam 
or by by uh, storing more water. But since there's no water, no more waters to store, it doesn't help. So now there is a thinking that we have to make better use of the rainfall. So we're talking about the efficiency of the rains. We have to do rainwater harvesting. We have to capture the rain with the water where it comes from. And I think that is one of the things that is now being discussed here in, in the poor river also, that you, they, the farmers, they want to build a number of small dams close to where the rainfall uh, comes down, so to speak. So before the river, before the water comes to the river or to the big reservoir, you can capture the water. So that, that is one kind of thinking. But then there is, a, shall we say, backside of that also, because if you are very efficient, if you are very good in capturing the rainfall locally, it means that the amount of water that is reaching the river will be going down. So it's a kind of communicating vessels that you have to look into both the local water use as well as then to have enough of water into the river so that you have enough of water into the, uh, the estuary, as we had, we had the salt water intrusion last year in the, in the Poor River. Then I think also that we have to also, uh, there must be some kind of system whereby the policies, the political decisions, they must be aligned with the social dynamics. And uh, I, I know here in, in the Poor uh, Valley, but also in Sweden, we have a lot of uh, stakeholder consultation. That, that they arrange meetings with different user groups, because there's also competition between the different users. So it's not only about political decision, but how do you get the kind of understanding between different um, uh, water users. I think there's a need for new data and valid concepts. It's a, uh, well, uh, let me just mention one thing. Um, I don't know how you pronounce it or how you, what kind of word you use in Italian, but in Sweden or in, in also in, in the English speaking world, we talk about food consumption. You say food consumption? I say food consumption is, is, a, is a tricky concept because food consumption refers to the amount of, of food that you're buying, not what you're eating. But most of the, most of the media, most of, the, most of my colleagues, most of the policy makers, they think that consumption is the same as actual use. It's not. There's at least a 25% difference. So I think that, and there are different types of, um, sorry, yes. I will. Um. No, go ahead. So innovative thinking, yes, I think that, uh, and this is also requires hard work. And I think there's a need for co-management. It's about water, but I also mentioned before that it's about uh, energy, for instance. There have to be some kind of uh, co-management between the different water sectors also. So for instance, when I talk about nutrition, the, the um, uh, the nutritional value of the food, it's also very much about the, the, um, the um, drinking water and those kind of things. Because if you don't have a proper a sanitation, if you don't have proper sanitation, drinking water, it means that you have a high rate of diarrhea and other infections. And if you have a high rate of infections, diarrhea, that means that the food that you're eating, it goes right through your body. So, I, but the, the planning, the, the policies are usually made up in these kind of sectoral, rather, compartments. Then finally, I think that the demography is a strong driver. And socioeconomic conditions, if you combine demography and uh, uh, if people get more money in their pockets, and if you have more pockets with a lot of money inside, you have more demand for food, for different things. That means that you have more demand for water. So that we are in a situation in the world today with a rapid population increase, with the rapid uh, socioeconomic development in many parts of the world, that you, have a, you, you need to have a more better water policies. Thank you very much.
So thank you, Professor Lundqvist, for your very comprehensive overview on the issues that uh, on the issue of water that we are facing right now. We only have uh, basically 10 minutes left uh, for the event tonight, so I will go straight to the Q&A session. So if you have any contribution, uh, question o whatever, just raise your hand. Andiamo direttamente alla parte delle domande, quindi se avete eh, delle domande alzate la mano e se avete anche, mh, immagino di no, però se ci sono questioni con la lingua potete dirle in italiano e io le la traduco, quindi non è, eh, non è un problema. Quindi se ci sono domande iniziamo subito. Prego, arriva il microfono. So let's say that in the future we, don't, we have an abundance of energy. Uh, how can this help the water situation? How can improve, let's say, can this help? If we have an abundance uh, of, energy of energy in the future, yeah. will it improve the water management situation? I think um, yes. I, I think that uh, yes. I tried to say also we we need the energy for different. Uh, I mean, we need the energy to pump water, to divert water, to uh, but also for for treatment of sewage water. So I think that is one of the uh, of the. Um, I think we we are in a um, situation where the water quality is a big problem in both in urban as well as in rural areas. But in urban areas, I mean, there you, I think uh, the energy is very, it's quite essential, of course. But then, then as I, just as an example, the, the end for the um, uh, sandstone aquifer underneath the Sahara, the, uh, in, what's it called? In, uh, underneath the, the Egypt, the Sudan, and so on. They need, of course, energy to pump the water, and and you can if people are if people don't have the water there, if they don't able to live there, they will come to Europe. So I think that there are we have to look for solutions in different parts of the world in order to make uh, conditions uh, decent and. Uh, livable, otherwise we have problems in other parts of the world. Ah. Are, there Are there any other questions in the room? Here, uh, quarta fila, qui. Uh, in your opinion, what is the most important uh, daily attitude that uh, we should have to improve our sustainability? Like what, what can we do? Basically, it's what can we do as citizens on a daily basis in order to improve uh, the water issue and to solve the water issue and improve our sustainable approach? Yeah, I think it's a good, uh, it's important. And, and I, I th oh, sorry, um, yeah, it's important uh, issue, certainly, because I think we as uh, citizens, as consumers, are important in... Um, in different uh, contexts. And I think for me, it makes a lot of sense to think about uh, food habits. Because we have a lot of food that is wasted and that is being, and we have a problem with overeating. So I, according to my calculations, roughly the, 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 the usual figure about the estimates of how much water is lost or wasted lost as a result of technical problem, transport, storage, such things, but uh, wasted in terms that we are throwing away food. The, the, the official or the general uh, estimate is one third. But then I said we should, to that figure, we should also add the amount of food that we are overeating. Because I, in my view, that's also kind of food waste. And if we add this, the, about half of the food Half of the food that is produced is either lost, wasted, or overeaten. And that is a huge amount of water, a huge amount of energy, a, a quite a significant part of the climate change issue. So I think, as, but the problem is, of course, that, I mean, um, we are 8 billion, and uh, it's difficult to organize uh, 
it's easier to organize water um, management in um, if you have a fewer number of people involved. But but I, I think it makes sense to uh, through education in schools or different kind of campaigns that you have. Um, awareness raising about the links between water, climate, food, uh, human uh, well-being. C'è una domanda là in fondo. There's a question, please. E se ci sono altre domande, magari alzate già la mano che così intanto che c'è una risposta già arriviamo da voi. Quindi adesso ci spostiamo da questo lato della della sala. Please. Hi, good evening. I was just wondering, sir, if you think the 2030 agenda is good enough, like climate change wise, or if we should add a few points to make it better? I think, I th I, well, I think that the main problem is to get them implemented to get them implemented. So if you create more goals without having a proper implementation um, um, things, then you, it's not much uh, use. So the same with legal system. If you have a legal system in place, but if people are not um, uh, following it, then um, it's, it's not so efficient. So I think that, that the social comp compliance is uh, and you have to follow up uh, the um, agenda 2030. You know, there, there's, when, it, when I talk about food waste, there's one of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goal 12.3, which says that we should, uh, everybody, both the uh, farmers as well as the consumers and the, uh, the um, uh, uh, shops and, and those kind of things, they should reduce the waste by half. And if you talk to industry people, they say, that's fine, we can do it. But if you look upon, if you, if you go to FAO, for instance, to look upon their uh, projection about how mo much more food we need to produce, they don't consider that kind of, of uh, agenda, uh, 2030 or SDG. So I think there is a lot of, uh, if the uh, different goals were to be implemented, then we don't need new goals. I think it's better to, to work on those that we have. Perfect. So let's start with the goals that we already have. <laughs> I think that's, that makes sense. <laughs> and try to pursue them. Okay. Prego. So thank you, Professor Lundquist, for the presentation of tonight. And then... I'm asking you, um, there is the, the goal to reach for uh, European Union in 2050 is to um, reach the carbon neutrality. Is it enough for trying to slow down uh, the problem with the scarcity of water? Or do you have to start to think something also about the, our neighborhoods like India, for example, or other countries? Thank you. I'm not quite sure I got it. Just so, uh, no. the, uh, in the European Union, yeah. uh, 2050 is uh, carbon neutrality is the goal. Uh, do you think that would be enough for, uh, to address the water scarcity problem, or do we need to start working with other countries like India and the Middle East? Mm. Well, I, I think that I, I'm not too sure about this beyond my. Um, I don't have enough of um, insight into that, so, well, I think I, I will, sorry, I can't really say very much about it. Okay, so, let's, let's move to the last question over there. Good evening, Mr. L uh, Dr. Lund Vesta. I, I, I have uh, to demand you uh, what uh, you think about uh, the, mm, the idea to uh, extract uh, salt from seawater and uh, do you think uh, 
it's uh, the um, prop may may could uh, the could may excuse me could make the um, uh, best process uh, to have uh, uh, water. Thank you. Uh, yes, about the desalinization of seawater. Yeah, I think it's being done in uh, in different parts of the world on a small scale. And I think today, today the cost of desalinization is about, I think, half a dollar per cubic meter, or something like that. Uh, so, so f I think for for drinking water, for household water, maybe for industrial water requirement, you can, um, and if you can recirculate the water also in the industrial um, factories. That, that could be a contribution. So half a, half a dollar per cubic uh, meter is not a huge sum of money. But if you look upon the amount of water that is required for agriculture, it's a small amount. So I think for, for food, it's not, it's not a solution. And then also, we have also, um, I think there's a problem with the brine. So after you desalinize, you get the salt uh, content uh, left. And then, depending upon the, the sea currents, if you don't dispose the salt or the brine uh, further out into uh, the sea, you have the problem, the ecological problem in coastal locations. So, uh, th there is some, um, some quite toxic element in that. So, so I think that it's, um, I don't think it's a big solution, no. And the energy requirement. Yeah, exactly. Energy requirement. Yeah. We have time for one last question. Prego. So thank you very much for your talk. Uh, my question is: uh, There's a big debate uh, on uh, public water to privatize it in uh, in Italy, but I guess in also in other countries. What do you what do you think about? What's your thoughts? Mm -hmm. Privatization. Yes, privatization water. Uh, yes, uh, I, um, I'm not in favor of it. I, th I, th I think the private sector has a big role to play in terms of the treatment. I mean, we have a lot of private sector involvement in the Swedish public water supply system, of course. And, but in terms of, shall we say, um, uh, when it comes to, you know, water, especially drinking water, such as uh, in most parts of the world, it's, it needs some kind of subsidies, cross-subsidies between the rich and the poor ones. And that is not, the private sector is not the best uh, solution for that kind of social kind of issue. So, so I think the private sector is fine when it comes to a number of uh, op operations, but um, for the more, uh, uh, well, for, for in, in in, yeah, in many countries, it would be not a solution. But I, I think I would like to add also that I think the private sector is doing quite a lot of good work in water, in the water sector. I've been involved with the Nestlé, for instance, uh, and Barilla here in uh, Italy. And when I speak to the, the, the colleagues and also what you are doing in, uh, in Campo, I mean, the private sector is, is usually at, ahead of, <laughs> of, uh, um, of the problems in many parts of the world to, to find solutions and they have the resources, they have the knowledge and so, so I think the private sector is doing a, a great job in many parts, but in terms of household water supply, no, I don't think that's a big deal. Uh, I, I would also like to give the floor to Alessandro Bratti for his contribution it, it, on the topic. Yes, I think that in the past, especially in this country, we have a, a huge debate about privatization. But just of the, if you look at the basin, you just uh, we 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 talked about three percent of the water that we use, yeah. because the drinking uh, water industry is just the three uh, percent, more or less, of the total water that you are that you used inside the basin. And we, we didn't discuss, uh, we, we have not discussed 
so much about uh, how much water is uh, used by agriculture. You know, if, if you thought about the, the debate that we had in, in the last uh, 10 years, I think it, it, this kind of discussion was really, how do you say, not, not fitting with the really kind of problem that we have. So unfortunately, we are running out of time, yeah. uh, but we uh, have an open, you have an open invitation to come back to Parma Thank next year. Uh, next year, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this event tonight, uh, we are currently working on your book. So next year we'll be presenting the book here in, uh, in Parma. Uh, the, tonight we only had the opportunity to cover a few sides of a big uh, issue on water. We did not talk about the geopolitics of water, about capacity building, about water management, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's really an open invitation to come back and further address uh, the, the topic of water. In the meanwhile, I would like to thank you and give you a big round of applause. And uh, I would also like to thank uh, again, uh, Alessandro Bratti and the Autorità di Bacino Distrettuale del Fiume Po. Uh, Alessandro Bratti, uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, we'll be talking about water uh, in the next few days. Uh, tomorrow morning at 10, uh, Alessandro Bratti will be again on the uh, floor together with uh, Giuseppe Castaman and Luigi Culpo for uh, Acqua, la rivoluzione necessaria. In the meanwhile, I would like to thank all of you for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, it was a very good occasion to talk about a very important topic. E quindi grazie a tutti e ora vi auguro e vi auguriamo una buona serata. A domani. Grazie. I will send it. No, no, no okay. I'll send it to you. Yeah. I didn't want to, to share it with too many people. <laughs> you know, in Italy, we, we, so it's, uh, okay. we, we're actually meeting on Sunday okay. to work on the draft. Yeah. And then next week, I'll send you the, the, the synopsis. Fine. Okay, thank you and so much. Maybe you may add something on the podcast.